Okay, our speaker tonight is um, the great Ed Anderson. I think this is your third time with us, Ed. And Ed, Ed has become one of my favorite speakers. That's why I, I keep bugging him every couple of months. And he's gracious enough to, to keep coming back. So Ed is a member and fre frequent speaker and presenter of the Astronomical Society of Long Island. Uh, they t talk a little bit about where they meet. Um, Ed is featured in the newspaper Newsday and has published over 15 articles on astronomy focused websites. Active on the Cloudy Nights Forum under the screen name AEAJR. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Ed. Uh, focuses That's upon... correct. Okay. And I'm familiar with Ed from Cloudy Nights, where when did you join in 2015, Ed, was it or yep. so? That's right. So why I remember Ed is because he started in astronomy and telescopes from zero, I would say. And I was reading his questions and things. And then suddenly it was a very short time later a year or two he was answering everybody's questions and ed you you knew you knew inside and out what they're talking about and what to say so i was pretty amazed by that um and then ed you started working on your uh seven ways to find things in, in the night sky thing and that's when we first connected i think mm -hmm. so ed has a degree in business with a minor in physics uh, and where is that from ed uh, Adelphi University on Long Island. Okay, great. 38 years of uh, outside sales and data center technology, recently with Hewlett Packard. Uh, okay, right here. So I, I kind of blew my last paragraph here. Uh, Ed entered into the astronomy ho hobby in serious manner in 2015, been enjoying a, a visual observing ever since. So I have you here having five telescopes. Is that still accurate or is that? Is it that... was, that was accurate up until Friday. Ah, see, <laughs> I'm not up and, to them. And either. and I saw that you had a you have a presentation coming up on EAA, yes, electronically assisted astronomy. Well, I just bought a smart scope specifically for that purpose. Oh, you did. Oh, that's not until August though. But but yeah, you're welcome to to join us for that. Yep. Um, all right, said uh, Ed. So without any further uh, delay, this the floor is yours. Uh, well, you got to give me the permission to uh -huh. uh, share my screen. Darn it, you're right. Let's try that. Hmm. Why don't it let me do that? Make co host. That's it. That's all right. I can do hand puppets and things like that. You <laughs> yeah. know, if we can't, can, so if we can't share the screen, you I'm, can, I'm. You can hold up your charts. Here it comes. All right, take it away. All right, let's see. Let me know if you see my screen. I can see it. I can see it. Very good. All right. Let me just put this into presentation mode. All right. Very good. So um, thank you all very much for inviting me back. Uh, you're obviously gluttons for punishment. Uh, the last time I did a presentation for you was uh, that uh, seven ways to, uh, to find things in the sky. And I did that from the basement of the customer observatory, and we had all kinds of sound problems. Yeah, yeah. Ed, so, Ed, excuse me. Actually, that was the first one. The second one was the uh, understanding eyepieces. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about filters. Um, now, many of us, uh, you know, enjoy observing, and we never use filters. Uh, others are uh, addicted to these things because of the nature of what they observe. Uh, when uh, when I go through this presentation, I'll be focused strictly on visual. So, those of you that are uh, avid astrophotographers, uh, you may have a slightly different. You you, have, you most likely have a different use of filters, different sets of filters. But if anybody wants to chime in and uh, make a comment, feel free to do so. I don't get, uh, uh, you know, uh, bothered by uh, questions. Uh, I, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I welcome your input. So here's what we're going to go through. Um, filters in general, uh, where do they go in the light path? Uh, we're going to talk about solar filters, lunar filters planetary filters, light pollution filters, nebula filters, and we'll probably spend more time on nebula filters than anything else. By the way, can you see my cursor? 
my little arrow? No, actually, I don't see you in presentation. No, I, I don't. You're, you're not in. You're not in presentation mode, though. I'm not. No. Hmm. Okay. Hang on a second. Let me reshare this. Hold on. Let's put this into presentation mode. What is that? Come on. I'll be with you in just one second. All right, and hmm. okay, well, let me get to the share my screen while I'm in presentation mode. So we'll do it without presentation mode. That's the way it's going to work. That's the way it's going to work. All right, so you can see my screen now? Yep. Let me try one more time to get this into presentation mode. If it doesn't go, don't worry about it. Yeah, that's odd though. Hey, I can, there it is. Ah, good. All right. And are you able to see my arrow on the screen? I can see it. Okay. Yes, we can see it here in the Nature yes, Center. We can see it. Okay, good. All right. So as I was saying, this is the agenda and we'll probably spend more time on nebula filters than anything else. Uh, so be prepared for that. Uh, we'll talk about the considerations of your telescope's aperture and then we'll do a little summary. So the key things to know about filters. Filters selectively block light in order to enhance contrast. And this is the key point. Uh, our vision is actually uh, not is actually heavily based on contrast. So uh, the image, the uh, example I like to use here to, to point this out is if you uh, took a candle and lit it in the middle of an empty field in the middle of the day, and if you looked out and if someone else looked out into the field, it's very possible they wouldn't actually even notice that the candle was there. Do the same thing in the middle of the night and that candle would show like a star in the sky. Why? Contrast. And the, the, the uh, single candle burning against a dark background will show up where against it's a bright background, you won't even notice it. So with the purpose of filters is to enhance contrast uh, for the most part. Uh, solar and lunar are somewhat of an exception, but for the most part, this is what the purpose is. Uh, they never make anything brighter. Uh, some filters are broadband, some are narrowband, some are line filters. Uh, some targets are light sources and some targets are light reflectors. So you select the type of filters you're going to use based on what you're going to be viewing. Now, where do filters go in the light path? <clears throat> uh, we have aperture filters. Uh, here's an example right here. This person has a, a solar filter on the front of a telescope. Uh, looks like an ETX uh, 90. Uh, and then uh, there are other filters that go on the focuser end. And we'll take a look at that. So for filters that go on the focuser end, they'll either attach to the eyepiece. If you use a, uh, a uh, two inch to 1.25 uh, adapter on your uh, focuser. Many of these have uh, filter threads in them so that you can swap uh, inch and a quarter eyepieces and they'll all share that same two inch filter. And there are diagonals that have filter threads uh, on them as well. So some in ca some cases you can put your filters on a diagonal. Where you put them is a matter of choice. Uh, sun and moon. Solar filters uh, are full spectrum uh, filters. Uh, and there are also solar filters that are selective spectrum. And we'll, we'll distinguish that. Uh, for the moon, we're only looking at full spectrum filters. So solar filters. 
uh, also referred to as white light filters, what we're going to be talking about mostly. This is a filter that you put over the aperture of your scope, blocks over 99.99% of the sun's light, allows you to observe the photosphere and the sunspots. Here's an example of uh, what you might see through one of these white light filters. Uh, in the olden days, uh, they used to have uh, solar filters that attach to the eyepiece like others. If you have one, throw it away. Uh, if you should see one in a garage sale, do not buy it. Um, they did work. Unfortunately, what happened is you were concentrating all this bright sunlight down into this little filter that was now trying to block it. And the things would get very, very hot and they would crack. And upon cracking, um, you are very likely to sustain damage to your eye or go blind. Think about when you were using a magnifying glass to burn leaves or other such things. Um, so we don't want to ever use a, an eyepiece filter. Um, although when I get back here a little bit, uh, you'll see that there's something similar. But for the most part, you do not use a solar filter on your eyepieces. Now, these solar filters can be coated glass or they can be a mylar film. Um, I have two and they are both mylar. Uh, some show the sun as white and some show them as an orange yellow, which is an example over here. Depends on the brand, uh, but essentially they do the same thing. Now, you can buy solar film and make your own filters. Um, and if you uh, if you do that, or if you buy a uh, film-based solar filter, and it shows up and you take it out of the package and the filter material is not stretched tight, don't worry about it. It's got little wrinkles in it and such, doesn't matter, does not affect the uh, effectiveness of the filter at all. Uh, if you're buying ready-made filters, uh, they are sized not to your aperture, but to the front of your scope. <clears throat> so depending on whether or not you have a dew shield, a hood, uh, whatever the case may be, if you're using an 8-inch Dobsonian, well, that's the size of the mirror. That's not the size of the tube. So when you go to uh, your favorite astronomy source and you're going to look for a, an aperture filter for solar viewing, uh, it's going to tell you this is 103 millimeter or this is a five, you know, 302 millimeter, whatever it is. <clears throat> and that's the opening it covers, not the aperture of your scope. Um, these things sometimes attach with screws, uh, you know, the kind of screws, side screws that will come in and attach around the front of the scope. Uh, some of them are pressure fits. Uh, some of them do not, are, are not really very tight fit. And it's not uncommon for you to use tape to uh, secure them. Even if you're using one of these ones with these screws on it, or it's a fairly good friction fit, I'd suggest putting some tape on it anyway. You do not want that thing to fall off while you're pointing it at the sun. Tape, glue, bicycle chains, whatever you can find, make sure that that is not gonna come off. Also, um, Make sure there's no scratches or holes in it. Now, typically, when you buy something new, you wouldn't expect this. But if you've taken this and now you've put it away, and you've taken it out of the box, and you perhaps haven't done the best job of protecting the film or the glass, uh, these things can get scratched and they can get holes in them. When I say holes, I mean like pinholes in the in the coating material. <clears throat> Throw it away. Cannot be fixed. And you do not want to use one that has a scratch in it or that has any pinholes in it, because not only is that letting through light, it's letting through ultraviolet or infrared radiation. And while you may look through it and say, oh, this seems to be OK, um, you're probably doing damage to your eyes. So uh, before I uh, I just recently had my uh, white light filter out of my ETX 80 <clears throat> and uh, before I put it on the scope, I held it up to the sun moved it around, looked around with my head, make sure I couldn't see anything that looked like a scratch or a streak or anything like that um, before I went to use it on the scope. Now, one uh, exception uh, that uh, where the, we do not have an aperture filter is the Luntz solar wedge. 
Uh, this replaces your diagonal. So you wouldn't use this on a DAB, you'd use this on a refractor, a, uh, an SCT or uh, an MCT. Uh, and this has a special filter built into it. Uh, doesn't require an aperture filter. Recommended for refractors only. Uh, I, I actually I misspoke before. You, can, you can't use this on an SCT or an MCT. And it has to do with the fact that you do not have an aperture filter on there. And inside an MCT or an SCT, you've got mirrors. And we do not want full force sun reflecting around inside the scope. Could overheat the mirrors. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, you know an SCT or an MCT where you've got the mirror attached to the front corrector plate uh, could cause a dislodging of the uh, mirror. So this is strictly for refractors. Very expensive, but I'm told that these are very, very good. I think the white light filter that I have in my ETX-80 cost me 18 bucks. <clears throat> now, um, this is really more of a, uh, a topic for people who are using uh, solar filters for glasses as opposed to uh, telescopes. But I thought I'd want to inject this anyway. Uh, there was a time where people would say, oh, if you uh, used an exposed uh, you know, film, of course, most of us don't use film anymore, uh, then you could use that as a, a solar filter. Uh, I heard about putting, you know, putting smoke on a piece of glass, you know, using a candle to smoke a piece of glass or whatever, and using that. Um, none of these are safe. Uh, the material may have a very low visibility, visible transmission, but they may be passing an unacceptably high level of infrared radiation. So the intensity of the light might be safe, but what, what's coming through that you don't see may be harming you. So do not use any of these types of uh, uh, materials to, uh, for any kind of solar viewing. Now for solar uh, glasses um, that you would use like during an eclipse or whatever, um, there is actually an ISO standard that these things have to be made to. So you'd wanna look for that ISO indication to make sure that it's safe. Uh, for binoculars and telescopes, use only filters that are specifically made for this purpose. Do not think that you can look through your telescope using your solar glasses. Do not do that. Okay, that's very, very dangerous. Um, uh, that glass, the glasses do not filter sufficiently and you're putting so much concentrated light on them, you'll probably burn a hole in them. All right. Uh, now, most solar filters uh, that you would put onto a regular telescope are, as I said, full spectrum filters. You're basically just blocking light. Uh, there are uh, hydrogen alpha filters that you can add to a regular telescope. Uh, this is a different view of the uh, sun. However, these filters are very expensive. Uh, this is a quark, a Daystar quark. This thing is $1,300. Um, this is a hydrogen alpha aperture filter that you could put on your scope uh, for a 60 millimeter size, it's $1,900. For a 100 millimeter size, it's 6,000. Now, I'm not telling you not to view the sun in hydrogen alpha because it looks different than it does in a white light, but this is not necessarily uh, the approach that you may wanna take. If you wanna do some solar observing in hydrogen alpha, then you want to, then I would recommend you get yourself a dedicated solar scope. Now we've got a member of our club who actually makes filters. That's what his company does. And he said to me, he says, Ed, the hydrogen alpha filters to be put on a regular scope, it's crazy. They're expensive. And you know, why? Better off buying a, a solar scope. And he actually mentioned this one by name. Uh, this is the personal solar scope. It's only 40, millim 40 millimeter aperture. Obviously, you don't need a lot of aperture to view the sun, but just like everything else, the more aperture you have, the more the finer detail you can see. But if you're a casual uh, solar observer and you're looking to get into this as inexpensively as possible, uh, he recommended this one. He says it works extremely well. Um, uh, this is about, I think this is about seven or $800 as compared to say the $1,200 filter to put on your own scope. 
moon filters. Now, unlike solar filters, uh, we do not require a filter to look at the moon. Um, it's a full spectrum filter, uh, a neutral density filter, as some photographers may uh, be familiar with the term. Uh, this attaches to your eyepiece, and it simply reduces the amount of light passing through to the eyepiece. Uh, most are useful, uh, mo they are most useful as the sun is approaching full. So I have uh, several uh, moon filters, but I only use them when I get past the first quarter. Up until that point, the light is not that intense, even in my 12 inch scope, the light is not that intense that it's uh, bothering me. Uh, most people will tell you, many people will tell you, uh, you don't really need a, a moon filter, just let your eye ad adjust. Uh, and your eye will adjust sufficiently to the intensity of the moon's brightness uh, that you don't need a filter. However, I have done that. And what happens again, once you get, especially once you get past that first quarter, is you go pull your head away from the scope and you're blind in that eye. Um, so I prefer to use a, a moon filter when I'm uh, viewing the moon when it's very bright. Um, so you'll see them marked as 13%, 25%, 50%. This is how much light the filter is passing through. Um, I use a 25% filter on, my, on all of my scopes. Uh, it's not uncommon to see people uh, using uh, filters, uh, a 13% filter on say a six inch or larger, but I find the 25% more than adequate. And it works very, very well on my 80 millimeter. And by the way, these, these things are not expensive. Uh, this Orion filter here is about 20, $25, I think. Color filters for planets. Um, when we talk about uh, planets, most of the time we're talking, if we're talking about filters, we're talking about color filters. Um, some of them, like the reds, uh, block a lot of light. They may only be like 50% transmission. And so some of the smaller scopes may not do well with these. However, the lighter blues, uh, typically used on uh, Jupiter, for example, or Saturn, and the yellows uh, don't block as much light. And so they'll, they, they typically will work on the smaller scopes. Now, the effects of these color filters are very subtle. Now. What I mean by subtle is um, you're looking at Jupiter and you see the belts and you're using a fairly large scope and you want to try and see a little bit more detail in those uh, belts. So you go put uh, an 80A or an 82A filter on there, which is uh, typically used for Jupiter. And what it's going to do is block certain sources of light. The next slide we have is actually going to talk about which colors are used for which purposes. But the effects are very, very subtle. So um, planets reflect sunlight. It's a white source. Uh, and so what we're seeing is what the planet reflects. By filtering some colors, we make other colors more noticeable. Uh, for example, if a red free feature is very faint, by filtering out blue, the red feature may be easier to see. Um, now, you'll see color filters will often have numbers on them. Uh, this is usually the Rattan numbering system, which is a, a, a system coming out of photography. Uh, there are very inexpensive color filter sets. The one up I have shown up here on the top here, I think is like $35. Um, these filters are dyed. Now, uh, as I say, they're very inexpensive and you want to give them a try and play with them and, you know, hey, I don't know, does color, do color filters really do anything for me? This is a very inexpensive way to get going. I have a six set, a six filter set that I've played with. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't use them very often. And I probably use the, uh, the blues for Jupiter, um, more than anything else. Better filters, which are uh, coated in the same manner as the more expensive filters, uh, work better. But whereas a four, cut, four set like this might be 30 bucks, you might be talking a single filter of 150. 
Now, here are some examples of where, which color filters we might use for what. So the number 12 yellow enhances red and orange features. Uh, sometimes people use these on Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, 21 reduces the blue. 25 blocks green and red, which can bring up cloud details on Jupiter, for example. Uh, light green uh, can highlight Mars's ice caps. Uh, the 58A uh, blocks red and blue, which can be useful on Jupiter and Saturn, may bring up some details in the clouds of Venus. The 80A and the 82A are the ones that I use the most. Uh, the ADA actually, if you go onto your Orion website or one of the others and you go look up a Jupiter filter, it's probably an ADA. Uh, it helps with Jupiter's cloud bands and can bring up details of, in the great red spot. Uh, as we were saying before, so, uh, uh, you know, the uh, they're, by shifting colors, uh, you may see other details. The 82A, in my opinion, similar to the 80A. Um, I encourage you to, to get yourself an inexpensive set. I uh, Several nights uh, I sat uh, with my scope uh, when the planet, when Jupiter and Saturn were up. And I just sat there and for the whole night, I just kept swapping filters, making notes, writing down, you know, did I see anything different? Uh, sometimes I saw a little more detail in the uh, cloud bands on Jupiter. Uh, sometimes I saw a little bit more on the cloud bands on uh, Saturn. Um, I didn't find them especially uh, helpful on Mars. Uh, I was using at the time, I think I was using my 80 millimeter uh, refractor. Uh, maybe I would have had better results if I was using a bigger scope. But, you know, if you're going to try them, the inexpensive sets uh, are not bad. Now, this section, we're going to spend more time here than any place else. So before I get into this, let me see if there are any questions. Anybody have any questions? Mark, let me know if there's anything in the uh, chat box or anything. I'm not seeing that. I'm not either. If you're um, on Zoom, you'll need to unmute if you, you want to ask a question. Or you can put it in the chat. There's a question here, Mark, in the Nature Center. Go ahead. Um, as far as the hydrogen, this is more of a common in addition to the hydrogen alpha core filter. So if you get a sufficiently large refractor, you also have to buy an energy rejection filter that costs like another thousand dollars. Yep. And if it's a five inch like mine, I had to buy that. And I had to buy a UV and infrared filter for another hundred bucks, and I had to put it on my diagonal. So that was something I kind of left out that's important if you're thinking about getting that. And if you get a big enough refractor, you will have to buy additional equipment beyond the Yeah, when I had uh, the discussion with a member of, of my club, uh, Tony, uh, like I said, his business is uh, coatings. Uh, he coats lenses for NASA. He's got stuff in the International Space Station. Uh, and he also makes filters for people like Teleview. And he said to me, look at, if you want to view the sun in hydrogen alpha, yeah, you can go buy these expensive, but you know what? Go buy yourself a solar filter. It makes a lot more sense. So uh, I think you just uh, confirmed what he told me. Yeah, it gets expensive. And then also um, for moon filters, uh, if you want an adjustable neutral density filter, you can get a variable polarizing filter and you can adjust it for the brightness. Mm hmm. Good point. I'm uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I I had it up and uh, and I forgot to mention it. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Okay. Let's go on to this section. All right. First of all, uh, I'm just want to mention here our eyes. You know, we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, going on. You know, that ultraviolet, infrared, all the way across. Um, what we consider visible light is just that we're only uh, sensitive to a certain portion of that electromagnetic uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, our eyes are uh, sensitive to and responsive to uh, wavelengths between 380 and 750 nanometers. So if we take a look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, we, our eyes see this little piece. 
Um, while you can use any filter on any scope, uh, the more restrictive the filter, the more aperture you need in order to get a good image. Uh, and the concept here is very simple that uh, if I'm filtering out for a very specific narrow uh, piece of light, uh, my small aperture uh, telescope is only gathering a very small amount of that. And so you'll hear people say that uh, things like nebula filters, well, you know, you don't want to use these on very small scopes. All right. I've seen the plus and minus of that. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to bring this up that uh, once you filter out all but a very small spectrum of the light, uh, how much of that is your scope actually gathering? Likewise, as we go up in magnification, uh, the more aperture you need in order to get a good image, that's true whether we're using filters or not. Filters don't change that. Now, there's three basic categories of filters I'm going to be talking about in this section. Broadband or light, light pollution reducing filters, narrow band, and line filters. So here's your spectrum here. And what basically we're doing here is you'll see, and I have other slides that show other uh, line traces, is we're trying to notch out, we're trying to cut out light that is not enhancing our view of deep sky objects. Whoops, let's go back to that a second. Now, in this case, this is a broadband filter, so it's letting all of this through. It's kind of notching this out, and then it's opening back up over again for this area of uh, light. We'll talk about narrowband nebula filters, and these are focusing in on a very, very small spectrum of light because this is very, very uh, specific to uh, nebula. What nebula are, pu are putting out as compared to other light that we might have in the sky. And then we're going to talk about line filters, which are even more narrow. All right. Now, the first thing I want to touch on is uh, sky glow and light pollution. Because every newbie that I talk to on cloudy nights and we get in the club, the first thing is, I'm in a very light polluted area. How do I get a light pollution filter to go make that light pollution go away? Well, you can't. Uh, so uh, what we're going to look at here is uh, what causes the glow in the sky uh, that uh, hurts the contrast between uh, what we want to see and uh, the light that's in the surrounding, the background light. So there's three sources. Uh, we get a glow in the sky from interplanetary dust and unresolved star uh, starlight, uh, what uh, you might refer to as the zodiacal light. Our natural air glow, um, there's just uh, things in, in our atmosphere that produce light based upon what the sun, you know, uh, radiation coming in from space. And then the one that we all know about and are most focused on are man-made light pollution. So um, years ago, uh, they came out with these things called light pollution filters. And from what I am told, these were these actually worked reasonably well, because most of the lights that man was putting up at that time were based upon sodium vapor and mercury vapor bulbs. That's what you you had the pink ones and you had the yellow ones and you had kind of a kind of a brightish bluish one, uh, and those put out their light on very specific frequencies. And as a result, you were able to filter that out. And so these could help you significantly filter out the, the, the background light that was being produced by streetlights. Unfortunately for us in astronomy, for, for the benefit of the municipalities, they're all moving to white LED lights. Now, the reason for this is because these use a lot less power to produce a lot more light. Unfortunately, they are full white spectrum lights. And as a result, we can't really filter them out. Uh, so when you go to uh, the uh, astronomy store and you see them listing light pollution uh, sky glow filters, 
what they're providing you is with a broadband filter. It'll block sodium, it'll block mercury, and some of the other lines for natural glow, but it's still going to let through a lot of the light that you don't want. Okay, because these street lights are producing a lot of other light besides what's being blocked here. So I'm not telling you don't try a light pollution filter, don't try a sky glow filter. But if, uh, if this was something that you used years ago and you're gonna go recommend this to somebody, or if you're new to the hobby and you think that this is going to make all the light pollution of the sky go away, it is not. They can still be helpful on many nebula, some galaxies. They do darken the sky to increase contrast but it's not a magic answer to light pollution. They do nothing for uh, planets. They don't do anything for open star clusters, double stars, anything like that. Um, narrow band filters and line filters are much better uh, as nebula filters. And we're gonna get more into this. Now, nebula, what are they? Uh, we have several types. Uh, there are emission nebula, uh, these are, these are light sources. These are a cloud of high temperature gases that are glowing like neon lights. And they are putting light out in very specific spectrums. <clears throat> Here's, these are, are some examples of emission nebula. Uh, we have planetary nebula. <clears throat> this is a type of emission nebula. Uh, tends to be uh, a, a, a roundish looking thing and they look very much like planets which is where the term planetary nebula came from, though they have absolutely nothing to do with planets. Uh, reflection nebula do not emit light of their own. Uh, they are being uh, illuminated by stars that are in the nebula. Uh, dark nebula are actually uh, things that block light. And so uh, the Witch Head Nebula, I see 2631 and others. So you're, what you're seeing is the nebula is actually the dark area that it creates blocking light that would normally be coming through that area. Uh, oh, I was pointing the wrong. Uh, so you got the Colsac Nebula. Uh, there's a, a dark section in the Milky Way uh, called the Great Rift that is actually a dark nebula. And then you have supernova remnants, which are the remains uh, after a massive explosion known uh, as a supernova. This cloud glows with the remains of the star that created it. And here's a couple of examples. So nebulas are not one thing, there are many different kinds of things, but basically they are gas clouds, uh, gas and dust, I should say. So what nebula filters do is they darken the surrounding sky to enhance contrast. <clears throat> now, uh, depending on which nebula we're looking at, and we'll, uh, we'll see a little bit more on this later, uh, the two uh, areas, the two line sets, uh, light sets that we focus on with nebula filters are either oxygen three or hydrogen beta. So if you take a look, you'll you'll see people, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lumicon, Orion, whatever, they'll have oxygen three filters. And what they're doing is they're blocking everything else except the light that's produced by oxygen three. It's a very narrow line. Or hydrogen beta. Now, hydrogen beta for uh, everyone's benefit, the line that hydrogen beta produces is in a portion of the spectrum that our, our eyes are not especially sensitive to. So even if we're filtering out for just hydrogen beta, we may ne still not get a very, very good result. Uh, and I'll uh, show you this later. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a report that was done on tests on a variety of nebulas with a variety of filters. Uh, and uh, we see which ones are uh, most effective for the most number. Um, Broadband, uh, broadband pass a wide range of filters. Uh, they can help with nebula, but not as effective as narrow filters. And we're gonna go back to one of those line traces in a moment. Uh, small aperture scopes may not work very well with um, uh, some of these filters. If your scope's under 150 millimeters, see if you can borrow a friend's filter, give it a try. 
Now, by the way, one of the quick ways to do this, um, I meant to put it on the slide, and I don't know why I did, didn't, is uh, these filters typically screw on to the bottom of your eyepiece. Uh, but if you wanted to, say, just do a quick test, let me go put this filter up here and see if it's going to help. You can take that filter and pass it between your eye and, and the light and the eyepiece. Now, if you have enough eye relief in that eyepiece so that you can still get your eye in to look through the through the eyepiece sufficiently, this will give you like a first cut on will this filter help me on this particular thing I'm looking at? Okay, so you don't have to pull the eyepiece out, screw the filter on, take a look. Oh, well, now that one's not so good. Let me take that one off. Let me screw another one on. Let me put that one in. Uh, no, that one's not so good. Let me screw that one off, put another one on. Let me take a look at that. You can pass it over the eyepiece and look through it, and you will get an idea of whether or not that eyepiece is actually going to help. Okay, before you actually pull the eyepiece out to go put the filter on it. Now, here is a test that was done uh, by a gentleman named Dave uh, Kings, uh, what is it, Neasley, I guess is how his name pronounces his name, where he went through and uh, looked at a very, very wide spectrum of filters, a uh, wide spectrum of nebula. And he used these four filters uh, to test on each one of those nebula to see how it would work. And so each filter got a classification uh, one, two, three, or four. In other words, one would be the best, two would be the second best, three not so good, and four not recommended. So for ultra high contrast, these are the ones that pass oxygen three and the two lines, uh, I'm sorry, two lines of oxygen three and hydrogen beta. Um, of the tests he did, 88 of them looked looked either the best or second best with using this ultra high contrast filter. And we're gonna look at that term a little bit later, but for the moment, this is Lumicon's ultra high contrast filter. I'm very specifically talking about Lumicon at the moment. Uh, he said that an oxygen three filter, which is a single band, or it's actually letting through two oxygen three uh, bands, got either first or second recommendation on 56 objects. And on six of them, didn't work well at all. Not recommended. Hydrogen beta, first or second recommendation for 18 objects. 88 for this one, 56 for this one, only 18 for this one. And not recommended on 39. Now, part of that has to do with what's coming, being transmitted by the uh, nebula. And part of it has to do with our eye sensitivity to the hydrogen beta line. The deep sky filter is a very broad filter. It lets through a lot of different bands. There were 10 objects where it was a first or second recommendation, and it did provide some slight improvement for all of them. But if you take a look at this versus these, you see that this is probably, you know, you're not your first choice for a nebula filter. Um, his conclusions are so far, with a few notable exceptions, the numbers show that the UHC, which is the narrow band, and the oxygen three are the filters of choice for viewing nebula, and to some degree supports the general recommendation that if only one filter is going to be purchased, it should be the UHC or similar narrow band filter. Now, here we're going back to the line traces. So, this blue line. These are the broadband filters. They're letting in a very wide spectrum of light here. They include the oxygen three and the hydrogen beta, but they're also including other light around them. And they're also letting in, this happens to be hydrogen alpha over here, uh, letting in a lot of light over in this area. So they will improve contrast some because they're cutting out this area, but not as much as the others. When we talk about a broadband filter, um, that's this green trace. It's letting in uh, oxygen three, which are these two lines, and hydrogen beta. And these, this is the broadband filter that, uh, that he is recommending. If you're only going to get one filter, this is what you want, uh, what Lumicon calls their ultra-high contrast filter. 
Uh, and the, uh, the second choice would be this oxygen three filter. <coughs> now, <coughs> the broadband lets in oxygen three and hydrogen beta, so you got both covered. But in some cases, cutting out this hydrogen beta will actually enhance contrast. I have a broadband and I have an oxygen three. I also have some of these broadband, uh, I'm sorry, narrow band, I should say. These are, the green is the narrow band. I ha also have a couple of these broadband filters, but I don't use them much. They don't really do much. <coughs> now, while I was putting together this presentation and I was talking to a variety of people, I had, and I was re reading a lot on cloudy nights <coughs> and people are going, oh, you should get an ultra high contrast filter. You should get a UHC filter. That's what you want to, if you want to look at nebula, you, you should get a UHC filter. <clears throat> then the next guy is coming along and says, yeah, this, this brand of UHC filter sucks. It's no good. Don't buy it. So I started doing a little more investigation into this. What's this UHC filter and what does this really mean? <clears throat> now I'm going to go back up here. Lumicon's ultra high contrast filter is a narrow band filter. It lets through oxygen three and hydrogen beta and nothing else. Covers this green section. UHC is a term that was introduced by Lumicon years ago for narrow band nebula filters that pass H beta and O3 lines. Companies have taken it and applied it to a variety of filters that are broadband, not, not narrow band. If someone says you should get a UHC filter for Nebula, they're most likely thinking of the Lumicon, narrow band filter, not a broadband filter. So if it's called UHC, read the fine print, if that's what you're gonna get as your Nebula filter. Now, here are some examples. Again, let's call Lumicon the benchmark, the one, the, the standard against which others are measured. Notice the bandwidth that they're letting through. Again, approximately this green line. So here we have the UHC E filter by Astronomic. Narrow band wide. So it's, it, it's, it's kind of like this blue line here without the rest over here. So it's letting in hydrogen beta, oxygen three, but it's also letting in all this other light. So it's not creating the contrast you're really looking for. Here's a UHC S by batter, 61 nanometers wide as compared to 26. UHC light pollution reduction. I've seen a lot of these, which are, you know, okay, let's take the light pollution uh, filter and let's add UHC to the name. And this one is also a, a, a broadband filter. Optolong UHC, I actually happen to have this one. It's a wide narrow band, so it's like this. I didn't realize that when I bought it. I said, oh, it's a UHC filter. This must be like the Lumicon. Nope. Uh, SV Boney's UHC, again, see how wide uh, the bandwidths are in these filters as compared to this one. Oops, sorry about that. So many, uh, many are using this UHC terminology on their filters. What you're looking for is a narrow band filter. I'm gonna I just, I can't emphasize that term enough. Narrow band. See if you can see the line trace for what this filter is letting through. And what you wanna look for is this green line. Oxygen three and H beta. Um, I decided that I was going to make a few suggestions here. So for a narrow band filter, uh, these are three that have excellent reputations. Now, Lumicon, uh, as far as I can tell, this is the standard against which all of those are measured. Uh, I have the DGM narrow pass band filter. Excellent reviews, 
uh, and uh, is very, very similar in its trace to the Lumicon. Uh, the Orion Ultrablock is uh, almost what the, what referred to as a narrow band wide, where it's not as narrow as these two, but from everything I read, and I don't have one of these, this does a very good job on Nebula. This is about 150 bucks for an inch and a quarter. Uh, this is about a, maybe 110 for an inch and a quarter. This one's about 80. Okay, so if you're trying to keep the money down, but you want to still get one that gets pretty good reviews, this Orion Ultrablock seems to do very well. But I'm very happy with this one, and this is the this is the one that uh, you know everybody tells me is like that's the standard. Now, now that I've badmouthed broadband filters, <coughs> uh, let's take a look see where broad broadband filters can be helpful. Now, we don't normally think of these kinds of filters for galaxies, but they do reduce some of the background light glow. And so here is a galaxy shown without a filter. And here is a galaxy shown with the Lumicon deep sky filter, which is a broadband. OK, and we can definitely see that the contrast has been enhanced and that we can pick up some additional details. So it's not like these broadband filters don't have a purpose. Uh, but they're not the optimum nebula filter. Now, what can you expect with a, uh, a nebula filter? Here's an example of the Veil Nebula. Now, this is what it would look like with uh, no filter at all. All right. You put the oxygen three filter on there. It's blocking out all the everything except oxygen three, which enhances the contrast for the nebula itself. All right, so this is the kind of thing you would expect, that you can expect. Now, exit pupils. Um, I'm not a person who focuses a lot on exit pupils normally. Uh, when I did my presentation on eyepieces, we talked about exit pupils. Uh, but uh, it turns out that as we talk about filters, and particularly in the nebula filters, and particularly as we're getting into these narrow band and line filters, that there are actually uh, recommendations on what kind of exit pupils we want to be working with to get the optimum view. And uh, so I figured I'd put something in here about this to explain. So light comes in through the objective, whether this is the uh, aperture on a refractor or the mirror on a reflector, comes through the eyepiece, and the width of the light cone that's coming through is the exit pupil. Now, why this is important is because this influences how much of your retina gets illuminated. The reason why uh, images get dimmer as we go up in magnification, forget filters for a second, is because we're illuminating less and less of our retina because the exit pupils get smaller and smaller as we go up in magnification. So if you want to understand exit pupil, the focal length of your eyepiece divided by the focal ratio of your scope gives you your exit pupil. For example, if you're using a 38 millimeter eyepiece, you're in an F6 scope, you got a 6.3 millimeter exit pupil. Now, people will talk about this because they'll talk about, oh, you can't use this certain eyepiece because it'll, the exit pupil will be bigger than your eye, what your eye can let in. Here are some average exit pupils for people, and you're losing light. If you attended my previous discussion, uh, you know, I had a little bit of a disclaimer against that, but uh, the key here is to understand what exit pupils are. And as we go up in magnification, they get smaller. And there are exit pupil recommendations for various filters. Here's Lumicon's recommendations. <clears throat> so uh, these are the four filters that were used in that last um, study. The deep sky is a broadband filter. This is the width of the passband. The ultra high contrast is a narrow band, is a narrow band filter. Oxygen 3 and H beta are single line filters. So you see how narrow these are getting. And then here is this big wide uh, uh, band uh, pass on the deep sky. These are what they're calling the optimum exit pupils for each of these filters. Now, how do you use this? 
If you can determine the exit pupil of your eyepiece, focal length eyepiece divided by focal ratio of your scope, what you can do is you can start to predict the optimum magnification on your scope with this filter for viewing this nebula. So as you can see, we're looking at uh, recommendations one to four on an ultra high contrast, two to five. In other words, we want a larger exit pupil if we're gonna use a, this single line filter, which means we're probably gonna to wanna to view that nebula at a lower magnification. Right. Aperture considerations. Solar filters work on all sizes of scopes. Um, this, these are my scopes, by the way. This is my 12 inch Dob. Uh, this is a, a five inch Mac, 80 millimeter refractor, 80 millimeter refractor. This one has since been replaced with a 102 millimeter ED refractor. Um, the uh, dust cover from my 12 inch has a removable cap on it that opens up to a two inch hole. Uh, and that's what I would buy my, uh, my uh, solar filter for. I wouldn't buy a 12 inch full aperture solar filter. I'd get a two inch that would go onto that cap. Um, loon, uh, lunar moon filters, they'll work on any size scope. If you're working on a very small scope, 25%, even 40% is fine. If you're working on a very large scope, 25%, 13%. And as was mentioned earlier, there are variable ones. Basically, it's two polarizing lenses. Uh, and you can vary. Um, I think the one I looked at last was from like 60% uh, pass down to about 10%. Uh, planet and nebula filters, uh, these can block a lot of light. Is the scope gathering enough of the light uh, that you are passing to be effective? Trial and error, the best ways to answer this question. Uh, I've heard people go, you know, you should never use filters on anything less than 100 uh, millimeters. I don't know if that's really true. Depends on the filter, depends on what you're looking at. All right. Uh, you all have the benefit of being part of a club. And Chances are one of your buddies has got the filter that you're thinking about getting for your scope. Okay, so when you're out with them one night, say, can I borrow your filter for, or, or can you, uh, you know, let me just wave it in front of my eyepiece and see if it does anything for me. Any filter can be used on any aperture, but the larger the aperture, the better the view. That, no, nothing changes there. Now, if you go on cloudy nights, uh, there's a gentleman out there named Don Pensick. He's a vendor. Uh, and he owns the company at uh, eyepiecesetc.com. <clears throat> Don is a treasure of information. He's a very reputable vendor. I've bought from him. Uh, and he does a great service for um, the cloudy nights community. Uh, he put out, uh, he has a spreadsheet out there on eyepieces. So if you want to pick your eyepieces by focal length, by uh, number of lens elements, uh, by, uh, you know, virtual app, um, uh, what's it called? I, uh, by eye relief and such, uh, you can just run his spreadsheet. Well, he has a, something similar for nebula filters. And in this, he will tell you, is this UHC filter, for example, is this a narrowband UHC filter? Is it a wide narrowband UHC filter? Or is this actually a broadband filter with a name on it that it really shouldn't have? So uh, this is the link for it. Um, but if you go out and uh, you look for the uh, uh, nebula filter, what, uh, I'll send a, a, a PDF of this presentation off to Mark after, but uh, we can we can go put that. Oops. If you go into the um, eyepieces section, I believe you'll find this spreadsheet uh, up in the top of the eyepiece section. And if you're out looking for eyepieces or filters, I would highly recommend that you visit with eyepieces etc. 
No, I'm, I don't work for them. I don't get a commission on them. Uh, Don has no idea that I have even has have this in my presentation. But um, he's a good guy to talk to. He'll steer you right every time. Uh, and he'll, he even provides good advice and recommendations on stuff he doesn't sell. So uh, go see him. So let's do a summary. Uh, filters never make an object brighter, okay? They selectively block light in order to enhance contrast. Some filters are broad spectrum, broadband. Some filters are narrow spectrum, narrow band. Some filters are line filters. Some targets are light sources. Some targets are light blockers. You select the type of filter based on what you're viewing. No single filter does it all. You will ultimately need a set. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, Mark, I'm more than happy to take questions or uh, be part of a general discussion here. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, fantastic, Ed. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, thank you again for another great presentation. Um, <clears throat> if you'd like to ask a question and you're on Zoom, you'll have to please unmute yourself. You can. Uh, ask it verbally, or you can enter into the chat. And of course, if you're at the Nature Center, um, you probably need to step up a little bit closer to the laptop since our our, our microphone was not working. Uh, but feel free to ask questions there. Hey, John, Don, or, uh, and speaking of Don at eyepieces, et cetera, I read that he stated recently that he's going to retire and, and close. Have you seen that? No, I hadn't seen that. That's a yeah. shame. Yeah, I know. I was shocked to see that. He's got something else he wants to do. I don't remember what it was offhand, but I read that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> oh, I missed that. Yeah, so another well, loss. Well, guys, go go grab his mind before he retires because this guy knows everything. Yeah, hurry up. <laughs> he has pretty good deals on eyepieces. And uh, he, a lot of times I've noticed he's had stuff in stock that other companies are out of. Yeah. So... All right. Well, if there are no questions, then I'll thank you all for your kind attention. Uh, I'll hang out for a little bit in case something comes up. But uh, hopefully uh, you found the presentation uh, interesting and maybe useful. It was re really good, Ed. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah same here. Yeah. And, and I really harped on that UHC thing because as I was preparing this presentation, I sort of discovered uh, the ripoff that's going on with the use of this term. And so that's why I called it out so strongly. Yep. yep. Um, I do have the uh, Orion Ultra Black. And while you were speaking, I hurried up and looked to make sure I, I knew what I had. <laughs> and it is an aero band because I really like it. Um, it's really helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as narrow as the Lumicon or the DGM, uh, but it is, per it is quite narrow. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, it yeah. does a really good job. No questions in the room? No. Nature, Nature Center doesn't have any questions, but we wanted to thank you very much, Ed. It was a great presentation. Well, thank you very much. Happy to do it. And Ed, yeah. were the, are we the first to receive that? You are actually the first to see it, uh, although um, when my club found out that I had put this together, they put me on the schedule. Not uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you guys, you guys got to suffer through the first uh, iteration of this, and uh, I'll be adding, uh, you know, show tunes and animations and uh, you know, chorus girls to it. Uh, but uh, you know, Dan Higgins. Dan, sorry, could you walk? Can you see that a little bit? Do I know Dan Higgins? Uh, I don't think so. Is he a member of my club? Astro World TV. No, I don't know. Him. We, uh, we get emails from Astro World, I think. Uh, we got on, on their mailing list somehow. Yeah, the problem, I, I've, I've seen, uh, you know, the, uh, the notice of those two. Unfortunately, they have them at the same time as our club meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like it. My adjustment I would make is I would add a note about the energy reduction filters because you do not want to make the same mistake I did by just a cork and if I not get to spend another $1,000 with a no-return policy from Daystar on the cork. 
Yeah. And a lot of those uh, high end, like those hydrogen alpha additions to a regular scope, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's frequently very long lead times on those. Okay. No. When was that though, Perry? Uh, let's see. It was like, I'm going to say ballpark like six months ago. Yeah, okay. Pretty good. I had to buy the infrared and UV filter as well. But if you've got a smaller scope, you may not need that. But if you have a reasonably large one, you will have to buy the energy rejection filter as well. And that costs another thousand bucks. Yeah. I, I, uh, when Tony told me, he says we were we're getting into this whole discussion. Of course, he's a manufacturer, so he's 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 speaking up here, and I'm asking questions down here. And uh, he said, Ed, don't buy any of those things and don't recommend them. They're very good. He he he, he had very positive things to say about them. He says, but if you're going to spend that much money, buy yourself a dedicated solar scope rather than trying to adapt your scope uh to to do these things buy yourself a dedicated solar scope so, okay you won't get full solar just doing if you've got a big scope like i do you can't see the full solar disc at once yep you guys will be able to see it at that good days what it can do so hey listen some of us have a lot of money <laughs> and and can some of us don't. <laughs> I would say if you're on a budget, definitely go with the personal one, though. The only reason I bought it is because I have a really certain high quality refractor to begin with. So. Yeah, what do you got? One of these astrophysics? I got a stellar view. Oh, stellar view. Okay. Yeah, if you if you got one like that, you want to uh, you want to run everything through that. It's it's interesting, by the way. Uh, again, I spent most most of my time on nebula filters because that's the area that seems to be um, uh, the most technical and the most mysterious. Uh, and again, I discovered this, and and the terminology is completely unreliable. So so, um, but I have, uh, as I say, a, a, a narrow band, and I have an oxygen three. And I have used them both on um, the same nebula in the same night, you know, so where it's conditions. And it's interesting because while I use the, the narrow band more often, my DGM narrow pass band, um, putting the oxygen three in, uh, I will pick up different things. Um, in fact, sometimes I will, if I could characterize it, if, use the Orion Nebula, for example. We've all seen the Orion Nebula. It looks great. You can see it naked eye. And you look through it, your scope and uh, in your eyepiece, and you go, wow, this thing's beautiful. It's amazing. You go put that na that uh, narrow band filter on there, and there's a whole lot more there than what you were seeing without it because you took all that extra distracting light away. And uh, so I did that one night and actually did a little sketch, nothing that I would want to publish. It was, you know, kind of ugly uh but it i found that when i'm sketching i i pick up more details i see things because i'm trying to you know how far is this from that and how far is this? then i took that out and i put the o3 filter in and i lost like some of the stuff over here but i gained some stuff over here now the narrow band passes o3 but it passes it with the hydrogen beta and so when I took the hydrogen beta away just by, by going to O3, uh, I lost a little bit of the nebula, but there were pieces that I couldn't see before that I saw now. So those are the two from nebula filters point of view. Get yourself a narrow band. I, I made a recommendation of a few uh, uh, and an oxygen three. And that should get you through uh, you know, pretty much all nebula use. Uh, one of the uh, in interesting ways to use these, if you're looking at planetary nebula, so now you've got something that's kind of roundish, and most of these kind of small, and you've got it in a field of stars, and you're trying to see which one's the planetary nebula. Well, okay, well, according to my thing here, it should be like the three stars here, and you're trying to do it basically with a star hopping kind of approach. You go and put a... Uh, 
a narrow band filter in there, and all of a sudden, all some of the background stars disappear. Uh, some of the other stuff in the screen disappears. And here's this kind of like luminous thing that now you see, yeah, it has kind of a roundish shape. So there's that, there's that uh, planetary nebula that I was trying to identify before. The filter will help you find that. Yeah, it's like turning on a light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, one of the reasons why I, I emphasize so much that um, filters never make anything brighter is because your perception would be that you turned on a light. That, yeah. that nebula got bright. Well, the nebula didn't get bright. It's just <laughs> everything else got dark. And so by contrast, the nebula looks brighter. But, it, but it's not really doing that. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I enjoy the effect of the nebula filters. I don't always use them, but, uh, I'm in a fairly light polluted area. So cutting out everything but oxygen three and hi hydrogen beta, uh, can really make a huge difference on, on what you see. Ed, one of the things I, I have, a, a switch that goes into my, uh, um, uh, diagonal that, uh, will switch two filters in and out and I have that I think it's the DGM and uh, O3 in there and it is interesting you switch in between and the differences you see in those two filters is pretty remarkable sometimes one of them will do with something that just a little better than the other you know yeah it, it is of course uh, they change one of the things that people dislike about these things is that sometimes they make the stars look purple or red or something like that or green um, uh, or, or they're all bright blue and people go, oh, I hate that because it's very distracting. And I go, what do I care? <laughs> I'm yeah, not, looking not looking at, at the stars. The... I'm looking at the nebula. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's worth having a narrow band and an O3. Is that what, what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Uh, and if you, you recall back onto that, uh, that uh, report that I where the guy tested uh, uh, these four types of filters against um, it was well over 100 nebula. And his conclusion was, if you can only get one, get the narrow band. But right. if you took a look at what his uh, his his uh, results were, it was the narrow band was the best one for the for the most number, but the O3 was right behind it. Hmm. He had 88 where the narrow band was either the first choice or the second, and in those cases where it was the second, the O3 was probably the first. Right. So right. Uh, see, yeah. Right. So it depends so, on which nebula, nebula you're talking about, too. Yeah, I have the I have the Thousand Oaks uh, Oxygen Three uh, that I'm very very fond of. I, I like it very much. Can I ask about how much those cost? The DGM uh, narrow pass band. Well, you already have a narrow pass band, so you don't need to worry about. It. I think the Oxygen Three was about seventy five or eighty bucks, something like that. Oh, that's cheaper than I. Thought. But I, but I've had it for years, so. Uh, uh -huh. Prices have gone up, and and memory has failed, and I don't really remember what I paid for it. But I seem to think it was under a hundred. But uh, I, you know, I I did the studies on the uh, on the narrow band filters, and it was pretty much Lumicon is is you know, look, saying Lumicon is like saying Teleview eyepieces. Right. Right. Okay. So Lumicon is, seems to be about the best, but it was like you know. At the time, it was like $150. And I managed to get the DGM at like, you know, 90 or something on a sale or whatever it was. And uh, I've been pretty happy. Uh, the DGM is kind of like, and, and I'll use, a, again, a contrast and eyepieces. If Teleview is the top of the line and the, the benchmark against which others are measured, Explore Scientific does pretty good. And my eyepieces are Explore Scientific's. Yeah, yeah. I have the ES eighty twos, yeah, and I like them very much. Um, and I've looked through the the televiews. Yeah, I can see they're a little better, you know, a little richer, a little. But the difference wasn't worth the difference, and so yeah. I'm very happy with my ES. So uh, uh, I'm one of those guys who doesn't buy the top of the line; he buys the next step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. Yeah. yeah. And now I've now I've uh, uh, put my foot into the smart scope arena. 
for any of you who uh, have uh, seen these things, the uh, Stellina, uh, the uh, uh, Equinox, I, I just got a Dwarf 2. Oh, yeah. The, the Dwarf 2 is a new one, uh, just started shipping in January, $500 shipped. Whoa. I just got it today. And uh, so uh, I'm just about to start playing with it. It's really focused on the um, the uh, electronically assisted astronomy. It's doing AP as well, but it's not really a heavy duty AP solution is really more of an EAA solution. So I may join you uh, when you do your EAA meeting. <laughs> hey, uh, John, isn't that what Chris uh, Bayes was talking about? The dwarf? He emailed it. I, I don't remember, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think he was talking about that. He was thinking, this guy buys everything, though, doesn't he, John? <laughs> well, I've got a guy in my club who has a, who has a uh, the uh, the Unistellar, uh, what's the middle middle little line there? Is that the Equinox too? Yeah, so he's got yeah he's got one of those on on order. He just got a dwarf, and ZWO just announced one, and which is also about four hundred dollars, <laughs> but that's not going to ship until like August. So people are starting to get into this area, and this could become. This is going to dramatically change the face of uh, astronomy because now you've got a small device, mostly automated, uh, that will give you that first cut taste of what an AP uh, setup will do. And, and, and I'm not going to argue with an AP guy and, and t tell him that this $500 thing that I've got is as good as his $5,000 AP setup. It's not. But it's going to take me to a level and to a place where I haven't been before, where now I'll be able to see a DSO, hopefully, that looks better than what it looks like in my 12-inch top. So, yeah, pretty amazing. Just getting off the uh, topic here. All right. Any other questions or comments for Ed? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Do they make any filters that make comments look better? Um, comets like Nebula are um, somewhat individual. And so you're going to see that uh, different comets may benefit from different filtration. Uh, I did see the last one that went through, they were talking about it had a green tail. Um, the AP guys are using filters to view these, yeah. but I don't know whether or not from a visual point of view, whether the filters are gonna help much, but I think it's gonna be very individual to the comets. Okay. You know, depending on what its composition is, will determine what the tail is made of. And depending on what the tail is made of, will determine what the sun's radiation is going to cause to glow. Because, you know, is that tail glowing or is it reflecting? I'm not that knowledgeable on, you know, comets from that point of view. So I'm really, really a little bit out of my depth. Uh, but I know the AP guys uh, will do that. But, you know, they're talking about cameras, not eyes. And the camera can do something that our eyes can't do. It can accumulate light over time. Okay. Call up this guy. I heard there's this guy, Charles Messier, who uh, likes to look at comets. So uh, maybe he can give you some advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have his phone number, though. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, we need his email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in a Bortel 8 area. And when I travel to a dark area, it's like Bortel 6. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. And on, I'm on Long Island, on right east of New York. Uh, about the best I can do on long, physically on Long Island would be if I got all the way out to the tip of Orient Point, I might be able to get down to like Bortel 4. That would be worth it. Yeah. yeah. But that's, Ed, a, that's an hour and a half drive for me. Yeah. Ed, just curious, have you taken any, has anybody taken any uh, SQM uh, sky readings in your area? Uh, they have, uh, not, in my, not by my house here, but... Uh, 
because not only do I have a Bortel 8 Sky, but I've got uh, white LED street lights and such all over the place. I can read a book in my driveway. Oh, my gosh. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, but I mean, SQM readings of like 19 are not unusual in my area. So what do you look at from your house? Planets and um, double stars? Uh, planets, um, open clusters, globular yeah. clusters. Although uh, if I get down to the darker areas, the globular clusters are improving. Uh, I very, you know, other than say Orion and the ring, I really don't do a lot with Nebula because there's just too much sky glow. And yeah. even with the filters, yep. you know, uh, the, I mean, it's just, you know, like I'm in a flood. Plus, with all the ground light, uh, my eyes never really dark adapt. You know, okay. I have a red, I have a red flashlight on. Uh, you know, I, I wear a, a red light around my. I've got like a red like head headband, but I never wear it on my head because if I see you wearing a head headlight, I go set up my scope about a hundred yards away, <laughs> because invariably you're going to look and blast me right in the eyes with your. Yeah. yeah. So, but I I wear it around my neck. And the way it hangs, it just puts the light out right here, which is right where I might need it, so I can take an eyepiece. But at home, I don't even need that. I can read the eyepieces uh, just in the in the glow. I have one little area next to my house. <clears throat> I let the bushes in the front of the house grow to six feet. Uh, I've got trees in the back. And I have a little triangular shadow on the side of my house that blocks the street lights. And so that is where I observe from at my house. And even in that little shadowed area, I can read my eyepieces without any light assistance at all. Oh, yeah. Oh. Awesome. yeah. <laughs> so, but so, but, you know, double stars, uh, planets, uh, obviously the moon, the sun, and uh, open clusters and star clusters look great. You know, but uh, you know, that's the way it is. I had one. I I, uh, I was talking about aperture before. Uh, I have a five-inch Mac and the twelve-inch Dob, and I stood them next to each other down on the south shore of Long Island, down Robert Moses State Park. It's kind of a Bortel Six area, maybe Bortel Five. I don't know, but not a lot of ground light. So you you you, you get rid of that. And I was I was viewing globular clusters all night, and I would get the same glob in each scope. And I would compare them. And uh, it was the difference between the five inch and the 12 inch was significant. If the, all I had was the five, I would have been very happy. The globs look great. But when I got into the 12, I could push up like another 100, 120 power and start to resolve individual stars, which I couldn't do in the five inch. Aperture rules. <laughs> A- aperture <laughs> rules. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness, does aperture rule. It really does. Yeah. 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 What kind of what kind of viewing areas do you guys have? Uh, I mean, you got some really dark areas. Uh, well, where Bob at the Nature Center and Doug Bauer and I live, I don't know what the portal is, but it's a white zone on the map, so it's probably similar to where you live. Yeah, it's pretty awful. Yeah, my, my naked eye limited magnitude is about three point six. Okay, wow. uh, and that's only in the north. Uh, from from uh, uh, from northeast to southeast, my southern sky has has very few stars, and my western sky has none. Uh, I mean, I can see Arcturus, I can see Venus, but there's nothing else out there. Um, so uh, you know, all my viewing is done to the east. Fortunately, that little shadow blank on the side of my house faces to the east. Uh, but I did a uh, I did a count one night. Uh, here we go. I don't know why you guys want to listen to me complain about my light pollution, but uh, I did a count one night. No moon. Uh, it was like midnight. Um, sky was reasonably clear, and so from zenith to the eastern horizon, uh, from north to south, I counted 160 stars. That's it. Oh my goodness! Now, now I took I took a trip to Cherry Springs, uh, which if some some of you know, this is like that, one of these. That's a whole lot different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's considered a Bortel too. And 
uh, I had to keep asking the guy next to me, is that Polaris? Is that because in my sky, Polaris is by itself. There's nothing around it. (laughs) There is nothing next to Polaris in my sky. And up there, it was in the middle of all this other stuff. (laughs) And I I said, am I looking at the right one? Is that Polaris? And he's looking at me like I've got like, you know, something loose upstairs. I go, you have no idea how disorienting the sky is to me. Uh, It is much darker up on uh north of the city uh, you can at least see the milky way there which we can't see many of us can't see from home oh, you I see it clearly there which is pretty cool uh, cassiopeia is a w in the sky yeah yeah you know the big dipper is all by itself and uh you know so uh, yeah it's nice <laughs> but from home here i can only see the brightest stars like what you're saying yeah even over the last few years probably because of the led lighting being installed it's gotten much worse yeah it's, well not only where i live not only did they i have a street light right in front of the house oh. and <laughs> they switched they switched it out from a uh you know i guess it was a sodium vapor to the white led and not only is the white led full spectrum but it's probably four times as bright yeah yeah i mean the kids the kids across the street play basketball in front of the house at at 11 o'clock at night it's like it, the new day sun <laughs> Oh, it's 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 incredible. So uh, that's you know the light pollution filters that I bought when I first started, which at least provided some relief. They're now in the they're now in the unused bin because I just can't get enough value out of them uh, to uh, to really help me. Yeah. Well, Mark, Ed, I'm going. Yeah, I'm lucky enough being out, out here in Colorado. Uh, you know, I, you know, I was, you know, with the seven ponds club back there in Michigan yeah. and I'm fortunate enough. I'm only from my driveway up to where we observe in Rocky mountain national park is like 33 miles is all. And, but where I am, I'm here in Loveland. I mean, the light pollution is, is, <laughs> you know, I, I can't see a whole lot from here, but when you get up in the park, you get some of the, uh, <clears throat> The foothills that start blocking some of that light and up there it's on a good night it's it's very very nice just the other, a few nights ago when we were up there i had some sqm readings that had a 20 like 21.2 oh that's nice which that's not too bad that's nice <laughs> what's, especially what's the, for being in this close you know what's the elevation there john do you think oh up at uh about 8500 yeah that's great <laughs> yeah that I, I, a lot i think I just did a presentation for our club on things to take into consideration when buying your first telescope. And it was as much for uh, the uh, members advising newbies as it was for the newbies themselves. And because a lot of the members are not up to speed on the technology that's available today and the new things that, that, that are available. Uh, but one of the things I brought up, which of course was sacrilege, was my first scope was an ETX-80. Now that's an 80 millimeter go-to refractor. Oh my God, it's a toy. It's a piece of garbage. Oh my God, look at the CA. Your brains will fall out. And I said, this was the best choice I could ever have made because it was light. It was easy to use. It was uh, you know, no effort to use it. And it showed me things that I could never have found on my own. Because I would say, go show me the wild duck cluster. And it's pointing to a blank space in the sky, completely blank. And if I look through my binoculars, there's like nothing over there. And here I am looking at this open cluster that this go-to scope found for me. And I said, getting that go-to scope was the best thing I could have done because otherwise I would have dropped out and nothing flat because uh you know i couldn't find anything yeah. and uh so you know i tell people take that into consideration when you're giving advice to people about what scopes to buy it says if they've got so much light pollution they can't see anything in their sky they're not going to star hop yeah. don't tell them that they should go memorize the constellations for the le- for the next year because the chances are they can't see them you know i think i can see two stars in leo I can see Castor and Pollux in, 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 you know, in Gemini, but that's about it. So, uh, having some sort of finding technology is really valuable. 
Yeah, and, and digressing a little bit, like my main scope that I use is a 15 inch obsession. And on that, one thing I just love, I have a filter slide and I have, you know, I got, I got a UHC in there and I got an O3, you know, and, uh, and a, a variable polarizer too. For when we do our public outreach stuff for moon. But yeah. it's, what's nice about that, and, and I, for me, I love the O3 filter for an awful lot of objects that I go with. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll take that over my, my UHC, but you know, that's, that's just me and a lot, a lot of the stuff that I look at, but <laughs> what's nice on that is like, when we have like public outreach, uh, I'll have, I'll let some of the public look at, look at something, you know, with no filter in there. And I tell them, okay, now put your eye back up the eyepiece again and I'll pop that old three in there. And they'll say, Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah the, the, the filters guys certain things man they make a huge difference yeah that's something i've been thinking about adding to my 12 inch is a, a filter slide or a filter wheel of some kind uh yeah. you know i tried it once on uh on my uh on my refractor once uh, with a wheel but i couldn't bring anything to focus uh you know the way it fit in it shifted the eyepiece out and as oh, a result man. i could you know so i but it was cheap. I bought a cheap one, so I put that aside. But I've got a 12-inch dob, and there's no reason why I can't put a slide on it. How do you keep the dew off a of filter slide? Or, or is it because it's inside the tube? You don't have to worry about that? Who are you talking to, Mark? You, John. Uh, whoever has a filter slide. Heat? Well, well, I, on mine, I, I've, got, I've got the heated filter slide. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, you've got the heated it's filter slide. Maybe half or two-thirds of that goes to the next one. Now, I mean, most of the time, I really don't turn the heater on, but because it's inside, you know, the upper cage, and it really doesn't, you know, as much. I think somebody at the Nature Center has a question. Paul. Well, it's not, it's not really a question. I just want to get in the discussion. Yeah. Um, especially, are you going to, after you play around with your dwarf too, uh, are you going to do a presentation on that? Uh, that's a good idea. That's a great that, idea. That, that, that thing has got me. I've been following the uh, the development of this thing, and, and there's been a lot of YouTubes on it. And uh, just for casual astronomy, I mean, it, it's the Nat's ass. So, <laughs> so first of all, I recently wrote an article uh, for one of the websites that I write for uh, on the emergence of the smart scope category. Now, at the time I wrote that, Dwarf wasn't on the radar yet. Um, and so uh, I will definitely be putting together a presentation for my club. Actually, there's another fellow in the club and I who are collaborating on these smart scopes. Uh, and we will definitely uh, do uh, something on the smart scope topic. Sounds the, great. Yeah, the yeah. key, the key. Mark, there you go, Mark. It's yeah. gonna fine tune that, and it'll be great when you get him on here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you're ready for that, yeah. the key, the key thing that I bring up to people, uh, and uh, you know, when I talk about this, uh, is because I've already gotten some pushback from the AP guys. Oh, that's a piece of junk. You know, you know. Oh, my friend had the Stellina, and he sent it back because he said it was trash. It's a is. What is it you expect this thing to be? And what do you expect it to do? Um, because you can go buy the pieces and parts and possibly even do it cheaper. And, um, you know, leverage your existing equipment. Now, I, I did that at one time uh, with the EAA stuff. Uh, but I didn't stick with it because it was, okay, now I had my scope, now I had a table, now I had my laptop, I had a battery, I've got the camera in the scope, uh, I've got to get it on something. It has to be a go-to mount because you really need it to track. It doesn't have to be as critical as the AP tracking, but still, it really works best when it's tracking. And I just found that it was just too much paraphernalia, and I had wires everywhere. And if I went to move to something else, I had to move the table. I had to move the thing, you know, so I just put it away. The thing that was attractive to me about the, the dwarf and this general category of smart scopes was that it's 75, 80 percent automated. Now, that doesn't mean everything is perfect and it doesn't mean you're going to get that 
image that the guy who's got the five thousand dollars worth of AP stuff has been doing it for five years, you're not going to compete with him. But if the dwarf works out the way I think it's going to work out, I put this up on a tripod or I put it on a table, turn it on. Uh, for those of you who know what uh, plate solving is, uh, if uh, you know if you've uh, seen the uh, Celestron uh, StarSense Explorer. They, that uses uh, plate solving. The AP guys use plate solving all the time. Cameras, camera will come up, and it will orient. It just it turns on. It knows where it, and it goes up and looks at the sky, and it does a positioning, and then it does another one, and then it does another one. It says, "Okay, I'm calibrated. I know where I am. What do you want to see? Okay, I want to see the ring nebula. Okay." Bzz, bzz, does a plate solve bzz, does a plate solve okay i'm on it all right so take uh uh 100 images of 10 seconds a piece you set the gain i'm still a little fuzzy on what the gain does set the gain and it starts capturing light uh and after the first 10 seconds you've got an image after the second 10 seconds it stacks those images and now you've got a brighter image with more detail. And after the next 10 seconds, it stacks the next image and you got brighter and more detail. And it keeps doing that up until the number of images that you told it to take. Now, what it does then is, is it does its little magic inside. You've now got a final image. You can save it, you can uh, export it, you can put it out on YouTube or do whatever you want with it. Uh, but it also gives you all the files. So if you want to take this now and go throw it into some astronomy programs, uh, some uh, astrophotography programs, and do some other work on it, you can. So to me, the, the, the dwarf is a, an EAA device. You know, if I've got my scope on the Veil Nebula, my 12-inch, with my filter, and I'm looking at the Veil Nebula, I'm expecting that that dwarf is going to give me a better image, more detail, maybe some colors, okay, than I can get from my 12-inch dob. All right? Doesn't do planets. Uh, and the reason is because it's only got a 100-millimeter focal length. Okay? So it doesn't really have enough magnification to really do planets. It's really focused more toward uh, the DSOs. Uh, it's only 24 millimeter aperture. And the, the cute thing about it is it's got two lenses. One's a wide angle, one's a, a, a telephoto, and you can do daytime photography with it. Uh, <laughs> so if you were, you want to shoot birds, you want to shoot, uh, nature, you want to, you know, take pictures of flowers, you can shoot it with the camera. The interesting thing is it's got an intelligent tracking system. So if you got ducks on a pond, you can tell it follow that duck. So as the <laughs> duck swims along across the pond, it'll follow it. And if the duck takes off, it'll follow it into the sky. Jeez. Oh my gosh. So now you've got kind of a dual purpose day night thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know how fast it can track. Um, you know, can it can it follow a football player running down the field? I don't know. You know, how far up into the sky can it follow a flying bird? I don't know. But uh, uh, it it has they make a very big deal about this neural network, you know, algorithm, whatever, so that it can track things. Uh, but it uses those same tools, you know, to track stuff through the sky. They just and the software updates are coming like crazy. They only started shipping this in January. Oh, OK. So I I consider myself an advanced beta tester. <laughs> You know, they had an early adopting price. It's they're going to sell it for four ninety five. Uh, but if you were buying it early before they ship it, before they get it to stock, as they the way they put it, they're saying in ten days now it will the the special price will disappear. So if you buy it today, it's three ninety five for the scope. Uh, when the price goes away, it'll be I think it's four fifty nine, or maybe it's four ninety nine. And then they've got a, a second part of the package, which has a filter thing, and it's got two filters so you can shoot the sun, and it's got a nebula filter, 
I don't know how broad or narrow it is. And so that was like an, ex, an extra 60 or 70 bucks along with a, an extra battery. So I was all ready to go buy uh, the uh, Unistellar uh, Equinox 2 for 2,500 bucks. <laughs> and this thing came out and I went, ooh, ooh, <laughs> that's what I want. So I ordered it immediately. So I waited from uh, February 1st until yesterday uh, to get it. And today is the first time I turned it on. So I've just been playing with it today, getting it connected. Oh, and it uses your phone and it displays on the phone, whatever it sees. So no, no computer required, no, you know, table, no wires, everything's wireless. You run that, you operate the whole thing from your smartphone or your, or your tablet. It works on Android and they've just released the iOS version. Wow. So, uh, I don't know, it's a $500 toy. So I said, eh, you know, about the price of, of a good two-inch eyepiece. Yeah, no kidding. If it works out the way I think it's going to work out, I'll probably sell my dub. Ooh. Because well, that's why I bought the dub. Yeah, so you can see things. And... and and I think this may see thing more than I can see with the dub. Yeah, yeah. And I, can, my, I have a 102 millimeter uh, ED refractor that does fine on planets. You sell your dab and pay for your EAA setup. <laughs> well, it isn't even a matter of selling it to pay for it. It's a matter of if this does what I think it's going to do for me, I don't know that I need the dab yeah, anymore. You won't have to carry. Yeah, you won't need it anymore. I mean, this thing, I, this thing lives in my garage on a, on a, uh, on a uh, what do you call it, a, a hand truck. Uh-huh. You know, as I tip it, I mean, it's easy to move around. I, I wouldn't have bought it if I couldn't figure out how to make it easy to move around. And it fits in the back of my SUV. Uh, and I don't have any problem lifting it because, you know, I, I get to the dark areas. I'm going to set it up 10 feet from the from the car. So uh, it's not so much the bulk and the transport. It's just I bought it to try and see these deep sky things better. Yep. And this little bitty thing, it's it's literally it's it's. 2.2 kilo so it's like five pounds it's in a little bag you, know, wow. you pick it up and put it on a table it's so cute <laughs> <laughs> and if it does what i think it's going to do um, i just don't need the big scope anymore yeah yeah that's amazing stuff huh? <laughs> so, well uh we lost the nature center yeah well told you know. me i don't know what happened um, wow. i thank you very much for your time folks i thanks for the invitation well, thank you. Um, thank you. If, for uh, thank you. Yeah, really nice. Thanks. Yeah, if you uh, you got any, any other slots and you want to ask me, uh, let me know. As oh, I sure said, thing. I just did one for my club on uh, on buying your first telescope. That would be a great one. Um, we won't have a slide, I think, till January, though, probably. But that would okay. be a, a good one. Uh, you know, I, I tell I'll tell you the same thing I tell the guy who schedules our stuff. I said, look, I I enjoy doing these presentations. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if I've got something that you're interested in, I'm more than happy to do it for you. And you know, if you put put you on the calendar and somebody else comes along who's got a topic and they want that slot, give it to them. We never bump people. But, but you can bump me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because because it's uh, you know. I do these presentations as much for myself as I do them for you, because I was taught a long time ago as if you want to really learn something, teach it, Yeah. make a commitment to teaching it. And in order to teach it, you have to understand it. And to order to understand it, you got to research it and you got to study it. And then preparing this presentation, I discovered things I didn't even know. I didn't know. Uh. <laughs> like, like, the exit pupil recommendations, I, it never even occurred to me. Yeah. Uh, or this, and I got very hot on this UHC name to only to discover that, uh, you know, it's like you go to buy a Ferrari, you find out it's not really a Ferrari. It's, uh, it's a Toyota Corolla with a, for, <laughs> with a prancing horse on the front. <laughs> so uh, I was like, oh, crap, I didn't know that. Yeah. So... Uh, when you and I talked, I didn't have, even have this presentation done. I, yeah, I, yeah. I committed to doing it. I said, you know, filters, that, that's a good yeah, topic. Yeah. I should I, really study more I, about that. I, I think I asked you if you happen to have a presentation. Uh, because the, the guy uh, from Raleigh, I found that he had a presentation, but he wasn't available. So then I said, I wonder if Ed has that. Sounds like something that you would have. <laughs> 
No, I've got I've got about thirty PowerPoint slide sets that I've done for the Custer Observatory for my own club. Uh, so so uh, there's probably a topic there somewhere. If you if you need a topic, give me a yell. I'll tell you what I got. We could you could do the whole year for us next year. <laughs> well, I used to do every month. I for the Custer Observatory out on Long Island. I used to do a presentation every month. Uh, from uh, April until November. Okay, great. So I, the eyepieces presentation was done for that. Uh, I've done presentations on how to observe Jupiter, how to observe Saturn, uh, you know, what to look for, what to use, what to expect. Yeah, that kind of stuff would be great for us, you know. Well, you got a slot and you don't know what to what to put in it. Give me a, give me a ping. Uh, sure. You know, if I'm not available, I'll tell you. And if you're interested, I'll tell you what I got. All right. Sounds great. I got off, guys. See you later. Good All right. job. Have a good evening, everyone. Right, yep. I'm leaving too. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm going to uh, end the session here.